not Pioneer. Pioneer is a program of innovative orthopedic networking, e-learning, education, and research that was designed to fill the gap left by the absence of face-to-face -face meetings, courses, and other activities during the 2020 coronavirus pandemic. But Pioneer has become so much more than this in the intervening year. Pioneer is a virtual, but also very real community of like-minded orthopedists striving to help not only themselves, but one another. With the latest video conferencing and educational technology, as well as a groundbreaking online platform, SICOT's Pioneer events, activities, and resources are reaching every corner of the globe, with over 55,000 views of our webinars so far. We're forging new partnerships, signing agreements with 12 other international academic societies, and building an enduring network we hope will last for many years to come. So, what can you expect from us? Free webinars led by key opinion leaders from around the world and across all fields of orthopedic surgery and traumatology, as well as chat shows with some of the most interesting and inspiring surgeons on the planet. Opportunities to take an interactive role in these webinars by participating in polls and live discussions. Free on-demand Pioneer playback service. Watch our webinars again and again in your own time. And coming soon, our new bespoke learning management system will host podcasts, an online version of the famous SICOT diploma exam, virtual training modules, surgical technique courses, a discussion forum, and much, much more. We hope you'll join us on this pioneering journey as we push the boundaries of what is possible in online orthopedic education together. Right. A uh, very good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, ladies and gents, and a warm welcome from SICOT Pioneer to all of you joining us from all around the world. Uh, we've done many webinars, and a lot of you have been following us. And those of you who are interested in numbers, we've done over 55 events, and we've had over 85,000 of you following us and a fan club of over 7,500. So we're doing all right, and we want to continue to do all right. And therefore, rather than basic hardcore orthopedics, we are taking a deep dive into soft skills uh, required to be a good orthopedic surgeon. And I'm ever so grateful to the chair of the education committee, Arundam Banerjee and Sasindran Samatratan from Chennai, who've actually put a fantastic webinar together on soft skills in orthopedics. So over to you, both of you, uh, to take on the proceedings and introduce the rest of the faculty and once again, a big thank you to all of you for joining us. Thank you, Vikas. And uh, as you said, we are trying to do something sort of new in orthopedic soft skills. So let me first share my slides. Okay. Are you getting a proper picture? Yes. Are you getting a proper picture? Is yes, it coming? So see, Abhi, can you yeah. see the slides? It's clear. It's clear. Okay, great. So, so we all, who is, is someone controlling the slides because it's not moving? Um, okay, thanks. I, I'll just keep the control if that's okay. Right. Now, as orthopedic surgeons, we, we think ourselves to be strong men and we think that we belong to a robust speciality. And we like, we love la laughing at ourselves. So you have all heard this joke. What is the difference between an orthopedic surgeon and a rhinoceros? And the answer, as you know, is one is strong, thick skin and charges a lot. The other is a quadruped mammal. So are we orthopedic surgeons really thick skin? In a way, soft skills, and soft tissue mirror this themselves in orthopedics. So let me talk a little bit about soft, uh, soft tissue and the attitude that orthopedics have towards it. One of my colleagues, when he used to operate, used to always say, 
that, you know, soft tissue is a nuisance, an unnecessary barrier just to get to what is important, the bone or the joint. And I remember working with a very, very good orthopedic surgeon in Ireland, in Dublin. And after he struggled 45 minutes to remove a piece of meniscus through an arthroscope, he really yelled and said, you know, in my time, Banerjee, we used to, we were real orthopedic surgeons. We used to open up knees all the time. And now we are just working through small holes. But I think the cake was when we went to London, one of my colleagues, he was a junior in the orthopedic department. And when he was working there, he had a very sick patient who was admitted the day before with a neck femur fracture. She was 90 years old. Her sugars were all over the place. Her blood pressure was out of control. And he just, he spent 24 hours stabilizing her for surgery. When the orthopedic registrar came in his brand new uh, suit and, uh, and said, how is she? He went into a detailed description of the medical management he had been doing for the last 24 hours. And the registrar just looked at him and said, can you please stop speaking rubbish and just show me the bloody hip x-rays? I really don't have time to listen to this. So this has been kind of our attitude towards soft tissue, a kind of a, uh, you know, it's a part of the package of being the macho orthopedic surgeon. Some people say, you know, it's toxic masculinity. Others say we are the typical boomer uncles, our generation at least. But fortunately or unfortunately, the times have changed and we have now learned the hard way how to respect soft tissue and improve our surgical outcomes. But what we hear now, and I've heard this a lot recently, that with the ladies coming into orthopedic surgery, they are complaining, at least they're complaining in India because they are not being treated with respect. They are not being allowed to often they're feeling, feeling discriminated, not being allowed to uh, do as much operating as their male colleagues. Sometimes they're having difficulty uh, being allowed to do various operations. So we are not respecting gender. I hope this is not a generalized story all over the world. Maybe we will settle down. I'm a little surprised, in fact, because as a speciality, we have never been petty. So today, we are going to talk about the interaction of orthopedic surgeons, how we communicate with the orthopedic patient, how to get the team together. Now, unfortunately, Patricia had a, a reason she couldn't come today. So I will be uh, taking two slides of hers. And, uh, and I think Shashi will also speak about a few things about putting the orthopedic team together. But almost everyone else is here. So we have Alvaro and we have Tak. Uh, we have Ajay and we have uh, Narayan. And so we are uh, trying to touch all the topics, communication with the orthopedic surgeon, how to get the orthopedic team to work together, what should be our interdisciplinary approach, how to get documentation right, dealing with medical legal issues, which is taking more and more time. And finally, Shashi will summarize the entire program. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit, just one or two things, a little bit about our attitude to patients. Traditionally, we orthopedic surgeons have not referred to our patients by their names. We often call them by, you know, the hip we have on the seventh floor or the femur and the female, free ward, you know, something like that. We, we often did not care too much about this has been partly because we have been a very X-ray centric a uh, group of people, but even that has changed. Today, a lot of people are not only relying on x-rays, you're relying on other investigations, especially with the advent of the 3D CT. I think the x-ray centric approach is gradually going to move away. More teamwork, more discussion, more 
uh, you know, we need to explain to people what we are doing, why we are doing it, explain the advantages, the disadvantages. So if you can't do that, your team will not be as effective. And the last group, the patients, relatives, you really have to be very, you know, you have to take them on board onto what you're doing because often surgery has two or three options. Now, there is another problem which we are facing, at least my generation of orthopedic surgeons are uh, facing, which is what is the role of generalists versus people from subspecialities? Currently, I think there's a lot of confusion with the development of subspecialities. We're not sure where the boundaries lie. Now, I've been doing it for 35 years. I think I've treated most of the usual conditions and I think I've treated them reasonably well. But today when I have a hand case, when I have a spine case, when I have a, a case for arthroscopy, I really wonder, should I be treating this? Should it go to a, someone who, who does more of them? What are the boundaries? And I think a time has come, like in other subspecialities and other subjects, we have to deal with these unresolved issues and maybe move on to consensus committees. I hope this will be something Sikot will think about. Vikas and Gau are here. I would like to hear from them if we have a discussion. What should be the role of subspecialities versus generalists? And the final thing, now as physicians, we have always been taught physician first do no harm. Well, I will just add a word. I will say physician first do no self-harm. And today we have Dr. Karne from India, who's a medical legal specialist. So we would like to hear from him. As you know, violence against doctors and healthcare staff is rising in the world. And most of the times it is due to a communication failure between the doctor and or the hospital versus the relatives of the patient. Now, we all know that modern medicine is difficult to understand. And even I struggle sometimes to understand some of the work being done by cutting edge uh, subspecialists, uh, subspecialists in the subject. So it's more difficult for the lay person to understand what exactly the doctor is trying to do. And one thing I think we have not sold to the public is that modern medicine still has a lot of limitations and it's not perfect. And the problem is compounded today because in private medicine, there are too many marketing promises which cannot be fulfilled. So I would say doctors right now, you need to protect yourself by developing good soft skills. In the past, orthopedic surgeons have considered themselves as God, but I'm afraid this may not work anymore. So it's time we think about soft skills and we nearly, and I hope that by the end of this webinar, you will get more insight into the subject than when you started it. Thank you very much. And I will stop sharing my slides now. Shashi, if you want to introduce the next speaker. Thank you very much, Dr. Arindam. That was a very good introduction, giving the importance of soft skills in orthopedics. I would like to welcome Dr. Alvaro Zamorano to talk about communicating with the orthopedic patient. Are you seeing my slides? Yes, yes. clear. Perfect. Well, thank you so much. Um, hello, everyone from all around the world. I want to share this uh, talk about communicating with the orthopedic patient. And uh, in the same uh, thinking of Dr. Arindam, this is a, a part of uh, the new skills that every physician has to have, to have uh, attending this new this new uh, patient uh, is different than before, and uh, we have to adapt uh, to to get uh, our best uh, results for them. So, this is my disclosure, uh, and I don't have any conflict of interest with this presentation. So, I, I will I will describe the, uh, make a description about the problem uh, related to communication, effective communication will be described as uh, as the better thing to to move on in the uh, attending of patients patient uh, center approach is the is are about uh, the new thing aspect uh, at the interview and the office also and uh, we'll share some clinical situations so the problem is 
we don't not seem to be a very good communicators. Uh, the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons in around 1988 made an extensive uh, national survey. And uh, there is some difference between the physician perception and the patient perception related to uh, the, the uh, fixing the problem about the patient. So the physician think that uh, he's really highly trained and uh, the patient perception is the same. But uh, when they're uh, sharing some difference between being caring and compassionate, uh, the the surgeon think is uh, going going to uh, a good thing, but uh, the patient one third of the patient that didn't 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 think the same. So there is a communication gap between what uh, the orthopedic surgeon think that is it good seventy five percent and the twenty twenty one percent of the patient think that is good. So there is a, a failure to demonstrate an empathetic response. So good communication helps physicians to understand patient expectation, thereby reducing liability exposure. So malpractice suites often are the result of the difference in expectation between the patient and the physician. So this, this thing shows at your left side, the communication task, uh, engage, emphasize, educate, and enlist. And at the at the middle of the uh, of the slide is the define it and the fix it. Define it is like the the uh, biomedical task that uh, diagnose it, finding the problem, and fix it the problem with the treatment. So there is. The same, uh, el pa the patient think that the communication task at, at the same uh, value at the biomedical task. So it's important to us to manage how we are going to communicate it. So an effective communication, many orthopedic surgeons struggle to listen and communicate with their patients. And it's essential to provide the best possible care for our patients. Patients are often experiencing pain, anxiety, uncertainty. So we have to give their, them uh, a good uh, ambient to get the, the health issue resolved. And effective communication can lead to better outcomes. Importance of, uh, about that is building trust and rapport. The patient more likely to follow the recommendation, reduce anxiety and uncertainty. It's easier for the patient to cooperate to, to get the better condition, ensuring the patients uh, understand their diagnosis, prognosis, and treatment options. And all, obviously, it will be uh, an improve in outcomes. So there is a lot of uh, there is a lot of uh, type of communication, the classic verbal, non-verbal, written and visual, but also we can add the active listening uh, to ensure you understand what the patient needs and the patient feels uh, heard and understood. So this is a continuous, this is a uh, it's a moment that you have to put all your 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 brain and your visuals, your hearing, uh, focus on the patient. There is uh, some tips for effective communication based always in empathy. So be clear and concise, be patient and understanding, encourage questions and answer um, them. Obviously be positive, use visual things to to add more uh, more diagrams, pictures, or models can be useful for explaining things and be sensitive to cultural difference and adapt. We must adapt to the patient. So in the patient-centered approach, the communication style that focuses on the patient needs and preferences, we have to listen our patients, we have to understand their concerns, work with them to develop a treatment, and the goal is improve patient satisfaction and outcomes. So when when we 
use this uh, kind of uh, center patient center communication we ask open end questions allow the patient to share this concern and experiences actively listening and avoid interrupting acknowledge the patient feelings let them know you understand their concern and feelings share information about the condition treatment and prognosis involve the patient in decision making so develop a treatment plan that meets their needs and be respectful. This is uh, an interesting interest topic and there is some kind of uh, lecture that you can download to, to get the better patient-centered communication. Uh, we all, all we, we have uh, cultural issues, so the patient from different cultures may have different communication style and expectations. Some cultures may value direct communication and other cultures may be more express, expressive, will others be more reserved. It is important to be aware of the, those differences uh, and adapt your communication. There is some kind of uh, uh, good good uh, forms to to start your consult uh, at the first impression always is going to be uh, our face huh? you have to well dress well groomed all, always make uh, eye contact be calm pleasant and consistent and always always introduce yourself and there is a this uh, uh, this quote is always my, my, my preferred to start my consultation, like a, how can I help you today? It puts you in a, in a position of uh, helping. It's a, uh, you, you put yourself in the same level of the patient. So six simple powerful word, words, uh, it's an open question. So start with that. And uh, we have to, to, to know the power of empathy hear the patient, uh, always, always uh, ask them if, if is uh, there anything else uh, to avoid hiding agendas that uh, can maybe an upward moment at the end of the, all the consultation. So familiarize patient with the process and the uh, needed information. We use humor, but carefully because sometimes maybe the, will be not so uh, uh, pleasant for the patient or for any patient in the depending of the culture of the the moment obviously uh, repeat patient words uh, giving them the the opportunity that we are hearing them sir and ask about problem thing related Acknowledging the patient emotion and values is really important for them. So uh, the patient will never care how much you know until know how much you care. This is a quote for, uh, from Terry Canale. And uh, it's really, really amazing how uh, he can uh, resume in a, in a few words uh, the the process of the empathy. So be clear and direct, avoid jargon, reflect patient style and values, use pauses, and patients usually forget more than a half. So you have to ask them what are what are they understanding about the, the process? And always uh, ask them what question do you have? Is there something else uh, you have been wondering about? Uh, things that making the patient comfortable. And for concluding interviews, how does this fit with your been thinking or how important do you think this is, uh, it is to do the thing? So what about the treatment? What do you think about the treatment that I posted to you? So review the diagnosis, review the treatment, review the prognosis, always be positive and express some hope. There's two different scenarios for me in orthopedic surgery. It's the, the office uh, and the trauma setting. So in the case one, outpatient consult, there is a guy for 25 years old, amateur football player, three days ago, ter turned his ACL. What is the patient feeling about the expectation? What do you know about 
your injury. So explain as clear as possible, then process uh, the process and the option and decide with the patient which uh, the options are uh, going to be. And in the second, an emergency department, a 27 years old construction worker, fall from height at work, mangle extremity, Gustilon Anderson, 3C, open TV fracture. And uh, we have to manage that uh, kind of a scenario also. So how to approach this difficult case? Is the extremity in risk? How to tell about that? What are the expectations and what are the what is the actually achievable as a as a trauma surgeon? So explain as clear as possible the long journey that is incoming. Involve the family, the relatives are so important, and be realistic and positive. And there is some quote to use is all, all the team and I are here to help you and we will do our best effort for you. So that is important in those uh, complicated uh, situations. So to take home message, effective communication is essential for providing quality care in orthopedic patients. Patient-centered approach can lead to better outcomes and patient satisfaction. Focus on the patient needs and preferences. Make sure that the patient understands their condition and involve them in their treatment and always respect cultural difference and adapt your style to the patients. Thank you. Thank you, Alvaro. And uh, that was a very, I think, clear and concise message. Now I'm going to ask Dr. Rajay Malvia to please come and talk about getting the patient documentation right. Rajay, yours. Sure. Thank you very much. Thanks, uh, Dr. Arindam. Thanks, Dr. Sasi, for uh, inviting me to do this talk. And uh, Dr. Alvaro, excellent lecture. Thank you for that as well. I'm looking forward to the next uh, set of lectures. So my remit is uh, getting the patient documentation right. That's what I've been asked to talk about. I uh, work in the Northeast of England in a place called Northumbria. So these are uh, some of the topics that I'm going to cover. So what a good clinical document uh, should look like. Uh, I will present our Northumbria model of uh, clinical documentation. I'll also uh, talk about some do's and don'ts and uh, present to you some mnemonics, uh, which will hopefully make things easier for you to remember and the implications of uh, poor documentation. Uh, you may or may not have uh, heard uh, of this phrase, verba volant scripta manant. So these were the words uh, said almost 2000 years ago by this guy, Caius Titus, and uh, he was a Roman senator. So in plain English, what it means is uh, that spoken words fly away written words remain. And even simpler English, what it means is that if you did not write it down, it did not happen, if it is not recorded, it, is, it has not been done, has not been considered, or was not said. So clearly, documentation is important because unless you document something, people will never ever uh, agree that it actually truly happened. And why is it important? Well. It is our duty. It's not just for medical legal reasons. It's our duty as healthcare professionals to ensure that patient care is documented correctly, that patient uh, records are maintained because it's fundamental to healthcare practice and form a permanent account of patients' illness and care received. So we should all endeavor to keep the documentation correct all the time. So what constitutes clinical record? Uh, well, there are lots of documents that can potentially uh, be uh, maintained. And uh, clearly not all of these are relevant for all of us all the time. But uh, over a period of a week or two weeks, you will come across uh, all of these. So make sure that the, uh, including handwritten clinical notes, emails, scan records, etc. All of them are maintained appropriately. And why do you need to maintain them? Well, it's again, not just for medical legal reasons, but also to, for you as well, actually, because uh, uh, we do tend to forget about patients after a month or so. We don't remember anything unless the documentation is uh, 
uh, there, then you will uh, never remember what your plan was for the patient. And of course, if the patient pa is passed on to someone else, if your records are clear, it helps in continuity of care, it helps in coordinating care, it helps in uh, uh, making sure that uh, if, for example, there is a serious incident, there can be a root cause analysis. And uh, there are other reasons like uh, improving uh, audits, aiding uh, uh, in diagnostic and treatment plans, and improving time management. So for all of these reasons, it's very important that you maintain clear and accurate records. Now, poor clinical records. This is just an example. This is an adult who has been uh, uh, diagnosed to have a Salter Harris injury of uh, her finger. She's 30 odd. And someone, uh, in all the wisdom, decided that this was a Salter Harris uh, fracture. Uh, uh, clearly not an orthopedic surgeon, but it's there in the records. So uh, quite silly, isn't it? So basically, poor clinical records, they misinform healthcare professionals and patients. They increase medical legal risk. And uh, there's unnecessary repetition of tests. For example, if someone has had an MRI scan or an X-ray, you don't want them to have another one. So uh, if there was a clear documentation maintained, then unnecessary tests uh, are not uh, repeated. So uh, and it can prolong hospital admission. Uh, it does uh, interfere with quality patient care. And in the end, it can lead to even serious incidents. So make sure you are not one of those who maintains poor clinical records. Unfortunately, there is no standard model for record keeping. And although there are some recommendations, but uh, the, the, the individual hospital, individual trust, individual healthcare professionals are left uh, to their own to decide what is important for them. So as such, professional bodies should outline what they expect from their members and organizations should have standardized procedures for recording and communicating information. That's the recommendation, but it doesn't always happen. In terms of uh, the orthopedic uh, documentation, these are the common ones that we actually have to look at. Our clinic letters, our theatre documents and ward notes. Now, Dr. Alvaro has uh, clearly mentioned the importance of communicating well with the patient. And we need to make sure that the patient perspective is in included in the clinic letters. I'm not going to tell you what you include in the clinic letter. I mean, uh, all of us would give a good history, take a good history, make sure that all the relevant examination findings are there. But it is important to get the patient perspective as well. ICE is a great mnemonic uh, to remember. So what is the patient's idea of what their problem is? What are the main concerns? And what are the expectations? And if you ask the patient uh, all three, and if you document it in the, the notes, then it's clear to the patient and to you what uh, you want to achieve in them. Now, I'm going to talk about theater documents uh, in more detail, but uh, uh, consent. Very, very critical in our practice. But you have to remember that consenting is a process. It doesn't happen in one sitting with the patient. It happens over a period of time. So when you see the patient initially, you have to make sure that you have actually laid down the cards to them, given them all the options, and given them the risks and benefits of intervention. That's all part of a consent. But uh, clearly, before the surgery, we ask them to sign a form. Now, that is the final bit but not necessarily the most important bit. I would say the most important bit is what we've already discussed. And uh, even in the consent form, quite often what happens is uh, we uh, sometimes we end up consenting four, five, ten patients just before their operations, and they scribble in the notes. It's illegible. No one understands it, but you go through with the patient. Patient signs it. Uh, but uh, in, in the end, if it is taken... Uh, uh, to court, if you end up in such a situation, you, it won't stand the scrutiny because it's not uh, been written legibly. So if you've got a clinic letter which already documents this, then uh, the process of consenting, the informed consenting has been duly taken. So uh, remember that. And other theater documents, I'll go through it later. Ward notes, yes, occasionally you have to do ward notes and make sure that it's again uh, uh, clear and that uh, your findings are uh, mentioned uh, and uh, of course uh, uh, it should be filed in the right place. Most of you would have come across uh, this particular uh, bestseller from Atul Gawande, uh, the checklist manifesto, how to get things right. Well, it's uh, uh, something which has been used by many businesses, not just healthcare uh, facilities. 
because it ensures efficiency, consistency, and safety. And that now it's thanks to this book that uh, you see checklists everywhere, not just in our practice, as I was saying, but even in an airport, if you look at the toilet, there's a checklist of various things, as, whether they have been done or not. So uh, 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 checklist is an important part of uh, uh, maintaining documents. And it was uh, Atul Gawande's book that led to this uh, the World Health Organization checklist for surgical safety, just to ensure that uh, you do the correct procedure on the correct patient and the correct site is operated on. And it's uh, again a process, it doesn't happen just uh, at the time of the operation, but it's before induction, after, uh, before the skin incision is uh, 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 made and uh, of course before patient leaves the operating theatre. So what is the Northumbria uh, model? So what we would always have is, yes, we will have, uh, this is a safe surgery uh, book that we have. Uh, it is uh, six to seven pages. It's mainly theatre documentation. So in the morning uh, or, or just before a theatre session, we would formally have a team brief. We will discuss all the patients that are due to be operated on uh, the day. And then uh, we will uh, yeah, discuss uh, any concerns, any equipment needs, and uh, the anesthetist will uh, get a chance to have, uh, they say, the surgeon will have the chance to uh, say something, and then the scrub staff. So all of us uh, would agree that this is the operation the patient needs and whether the equipment is there or not. So that's uh, you know, the first thing that we uh, have. And then you start the list. The patient uh, uh, comes into the theater, and we have uh, another sign-in process where you again actually make sure that the correct patient is in theatre and the anaesthetist also make sure that all the appropriate things that uh, they need for the anaesthetic is available. So that's the sign-in process which is done with the patients awake. So the patient is uh, a participant of uh, uh, this process. So there's no way of uh, getting it wrong when the patient, once the patient has participated. Now, oops, it's not moving forward, sorry. I'll just see what's going on. So the, the next uh, thing is the, 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 the who, the timeout uh, process. So uh, this is where uh, the, uh, the patient has already been anesthetized. And uh, you have another uh, check. You stop. If the whole, all the members of the team would stop, they have to think, they have to pause, they have to then proceed. So what do you check in this time? You check the patient identity again because the patient is asleep. And uh, some Places have anesthetic room. Some patients, uh, some places have uh, 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 anesthesia administered elsewhere, and then the patients are wheeled into theater. So it's important to do that actually. Check the patient identity, check again the site, the procedure, the position, whether the implants are all available, and no surgery uh, 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 would happen until all of these uh, concerns are actually resolved. And that's when you, you start uh, the operation. Now, you would think that it's uh, a bit too much. But uh, things do happen, strange things happen. Uh, uh, I've had uh, personally had a patient who uh, needed bilateral surgery. On one side needed a hip injection, very simple. On the other side needed a knee arthroscopy. And uh, I did the hip injection, uh, went and scrubbed my hand, came back, surgical assistant had put the tunica on. Everything was prepared just for me to start the operation. Uh, and what do you see? Actually, the patient's uh, wrong knee had been prepared. So unless there was a time or process, this wouldn't have been picked up. So things happen and, and it would have happened to all of us at some point. It's just that we, if you take care, uh, at least a uh, uh, critical incident would not happen. So once uh, you've had the time out, once you've finished the operation, there's another uh, thing called sign out where uh, you would... Uh, Make sure that the correct operation has been performed and the count is correct and all the other things. For example, have the implants that uh, have been used were the right. And now again, it seems silly, but for example, if you're doing a knee replacement or a hip replacement, there have been occasions where uh, the wrong side femoral component has been implanted, the wrong size, uh, a size uh, femoral head has been uh, implanted, 32 head instead of 28 or vice versa. So sign out will actually uh, pick this up. And then at the end, uh, you have to have a debrief. If there has been an issue particularly, you need to make sure that it's mentioned in the debrief and it goes in the documentation so that there's a learning point for everyone. 
then there are other documentation which uh, luckily we are not involved in the nursing staff uh, uh, maintain uh, looking at the pressure points looking at tunica application if tunica had been used and for how long if the patient uh, had a traction how long the traction was on for uh, and, and so on and so forth so quite uh, uh, a detailed list of things uh, to uh, to be maintained and uh, this all goes in the documentation of the patient so there's a clear record of what has happened in theater so if uh, there is an incident that is picked up later on then uh, it can be investigated appropriately so there are some do's and don'ts in clinical record entries and it's important uh, to remember that so do's yes make sure if you're doing an entry use timed entries do not use abbreviations because no one would understand what your abbreviation means make objective comments uh, if you're dictating a clinical letter make it object don't make it subjective and certainly don't uh, uh, put any offensive humorous or uh, untoward comments because that's what leads to complaints if there is any non compliance on the part of the patient who documented a uh, smoker will have higher complication rate and alcoholic will have a higher complication rate your duty is to inform them and if they are not following instruction you need to document it do not use ambiguous terms that you the patient or someone else following you does not understand and even if there is an oral communication sometimes you ring patients and then you forget you move on you ring another patient and then third fourth and uh, uh, none of that is documented but it's important that even a uh, phone conversation that documented and uh, if you are altering or deleting any content Uh, make sure that, that that you don't wipe it off completely that it is untraceable if you want to delete something just a single uh, stroke uh, you know, to cross it off is enough because if it's uh, you know, been uh, highlighted in black it means you're trying to actually uh, hide something you don't want that to it to appear like that and yes informed consent needs to be documented I've already alluded to it and if there's an objection regarding care or case management if you're not happy to offer something to a patient you need to actually document it and explain why so uh, another mnemonic mnemonic that i'm going to mention uh, that in the end whatever documentation you do it should be a mirror image of what you've done and seen so facts is the mnemonic what does it mean yes you need to introduce facts so it should be factual it should be accurate what the documentation is there should be accurate should be consistent so if you dictate something today and if you are going to uh, do something else after 5 days or, or if someone else is going to also document it should all be consistent it should be the same because if it is inconsistent there is some uh, error in communication and it should be done in a timely way uh, retrospective entries i uh, would say that uh, uh, it's something that is frowned upon and uh, it should be shared so uh, whatever documentation you do it should be shared with the patient shared with whoever else is the healthcare provider legal issues will be covered in, uh, uh, in i think the last talk uh, in then yes accuracy and legibility of clinical record content is important this is what people will look at Uh, you need to make sure that it's all confidential and data protection laws are followed and remember patients do have a right to access their medical records so in summary uh, we are all accountable for our actions and omissions in record keeping to maintain good quality records remember eyes remember facts remember that poor record keeping can have a drastic consequence and uh, we are not accountable just to our employer and professional body but uh, 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 it can be legally looked at in the future it can be brought to a court of law as evidence during a trial or medical record so it needs to be absolutely perfect thank you very much i think we are going to take questions at the end is that right sachin yes we will take the questions thank you now i request dr narayan karni to talk about dealing with medical legal issues in orthopedics 
over to Dr. Karni. And I just request all the speakers to try and please stick to the time. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sasinda and uh, uh, Dr. Arindam for giving this opportunity to have a talk in this such a prestigious webinar. Well, uh, dealing with the medical legal issues in the orthopedics has become uh, very common these days. I'm talking about the situation in India because it is a little different than other parts of the world. And uh, the this is, has become a current burning issue in the private practice. It is a nightmare of every practitioner, whatever his age, experience, expertise and the reputation. Incidences are increasing by exponential speed and very rapidly. In the past, we had confidence about the police, judiciary, media, and the society. But now we have found that all these things, all these uh, uh, are the unsympathetic and there is a hostile environment about the doctors in the India. The thing is that we don't know anything about medical knowledge in our educational career. Most of the doctors don't know what laws, what rules, regulations are applicable to the doctors and nursing homes. There are 135 rules which are applicable uh, to the doctors. Many laws are either unclear, ambiguous, impractical, outdated, ridiculous, or certain draconian. Possibility of the litigation starts with dissatisfied patient or the death of the patient. The patient can go to consumer forum, police complaints. He can go to the medical council for uh, derecognition of the registration of doctor, or he can go in the criminal court also. In the past, we used to challenge the dissatisfied patient that you can go to the police, you go to the court and we'll uh, 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 take a justice there. But now the situation has changed. But I advise all people are managed before the patient does the police complaint. If at all required, shell out money even if the ego gets hurt. Because, and even after the police complaint, before FI register, you try to manage it. And again after that also before charge sheet is filed. Because once the case becomes subjudiced, the experience of the all those who are involved is a, it's a long, painful and expensive battle. And even in the appeals also, we are most likely to use in the last 4-5 years. The unpleasant truth about us is that we are we may be highly academic, but we are ignorant, illiterate, apathetic about all these rules. We are callous about the important aspects and the serious consequences of the medical legal issues. We remain pre unprepared for any eventualities. The dead of the doctors considered as a god, the noble profession, are diminishing very fast. Thanks to the hostile bureaucracy, TRP seeking, sold out media, pseudo NGOs, and opportunistic people as well as politicians, the perception of doctor has changed drastically in the society. Now, exactly when you should start taking precaution to avoid the litigation? Consider every patient is a political litigant, however closed, mild, humble, uninfluential, or the sweet he is. Start evaluating as soon as the patient enters consulting or the emergency room. In the past, we should thinking that uh, uh, when a patient enters the room, how medically best we can give. But now the time has come that you should think that where this person can trap me or put me into the litigation. No doubt on one side, you should think how best you can help the patient, treat him and cure him. But at the same time, keep in mind that he may sue you, abuse you, trap you, or even he may be doing a sting operation for you. Mm -hmm. I agree, most of the patients are not like that. But one nasty patient, one unfortunate incident, can spoil whole life or the career of a doctor. There are many doctors who have left their private practice after this. It can give tremendous mental torture, financial losses. It will damage the reputation, which was earned after many years of the sincere and the hard work. Secondly, don't know who is that patient or who, when it will be, which day that will be, which incidents sometimes apparently innocuous can land you in trouble. And sometimes you find after two to three years when you get a notice that this particular incident has caused the issues. Now, what you have to verify, you are whether one should see whether you have got your state registration as well as renewal of your registration because these are the parts which come very important in the court. Even if you are very, uh, you have not done any medical negligence, if these things are not there, then you are held guilty. Then where your hospital or nursing home has got a local uh, registration, married local registration, there are, uh, you have to fulfill all the lines of the all equipments you are having. For a nursing home, about 46 different permissions are required here in Maharashtra. There are a few of them are BARC for the X-ray machine, ultrasound machine, spirit license, fentanyl license, boy waste management, and so what's not. Documentation, that's now uh, Dr. Malvi has uh, elaborated that what is there in the UK. Here also it is very, very important and is the most neglected part which I observed in my practice. Every stroke of your pain in submitted documents is medical legally answerable. It can land up in problem as well as save your skin also. So choose your words very carefully in any document. Verify precisely, especially when you are handing over the documents to the police or even to the patient. 
because you can't change later on any document for that matter if you try to attempt to change it it is a criminal offense which will put you behind the bars about opd record many doctors don't keep opd record with themselves proper opd paper with all the patient information has become mandatory now especially now photo id because in certain cases there was impersonation for insurance you have to do this to avoid the change in the identity if there is any grave injury or the suspicious then you inform the police and take the signature of that for the orthopedicians and preferably from the patient that he doesn't want to do medical legal case or police complaint patient gives the history or the relatives give history that he has fallen in the bathroom and it later on it is found that the son has uh, banged the father on the ground and then he got a hip fracture then there are certain cases where you have to make a compulsory police information even if the patient doesn't want it so that the unconscious patient dying or dead patients in case of any violence suspected foul play or a married woman if she is in less than 7 years of the marriage especially while examining the female patient there has to be a female attendant please take a note of all these things even if the patient knows you otherwise it will be very very difficult to defend the allegations of molestation it has happened even in presence of the people the allegations of molestation was there and it can be sting operation which has happened in hyderabad it's better to have a cctv in the opd but just avoid the examination table area the cctv has saved many doctors from this allegations about opd record maintain opd case paper write all important clinical notes mention there is any allergy or side effect of medicine in the past because if the if there is patient is having allergy and uh, uh, there is a very very famous case of diclofenac reaction in uh, pune itself which has uh, almost international repercussions then probably impression of your uh, the diagnosis investigation advice treatment given and further treatment suggested has to be mentioned in the opd paper otherwise patient will uh, later on he will claim that you have not advised him at all and uh, suppose there is head injury in the ct scan is not advised then that can become an uh, negligence as far as investigations are concerned when you are treating the patient don't follow blindly the reports which are there especially imaging try to learn them read them you are liable for any cause of the treatment given based on these reports if there is something wrong with this uh, mr report in the shoulder or the knee joint uh, or in the spine and you are bring it and something different comes up uh, you'll be in a trouble because it should match with your clinical judgment that happens mainly in these three areas and uh, for the metaphyseal fracture now it is better to go for ct which was not there in the past there has happened in the histopathological reports you it is better to take from different to different pathologists one of the case which has gone against a doctor because the report was that of the hodgkin lymphoma and later on it was found to have the uh, um, lymphoid reaction so doctor was penalized for that even, even without any uh, direct uh, reason for him a direct uh, uh, cause attributed to him as i said for head, head injury advise city brain if patient not being at least mention that on the paper or the prescription that can save you from the later on present things now about the prescription is the most important document of the opd that is what the patient is having with him when he leaves you you can't make any changes in the document later on now there are three tyrants i use the words who can squeeze you on uh, something goes wrong with the prescription one is a medical council second is fda and third is a judiciary medical council can suspend registration if you prescribe non allopathic medicines the food and drug administration can take criminal action against you if you don't follow proper prescription format which is given in this fda website and judiciary comes in picture only when a case has been filed against you judge may not understand what the medicines you are given whether they are correct or not but he observes what instructions you are given to the patient like say for not bedding for so and so many days mention the patient is taking irregular treatment and he is not following your advices you have to mention that in paper that i am explaining patient but he is not taking irregular treatment because later on he can claim that you have given him irregular treatment and if you are advice surgery and that is not accepted by the patient at a proper time you have to mention that you had advised the surgery what is the possible diagnosis and prognosis and if the patient doesn't do the surgery what will be the likely complications mention the prescription all possible side effects of the complications of the medicine about issuing the certificate is a big thing never change date according to the patient convenience which is a very common scenario in the opd especially never give predated certificate never change the date of the admission or the discharge never write the procedure you have not done in the certificate because if that is exposed it is a criminal serious offense never change any certificate which is already issued under any circumstances even to your staff also and for injury certificate or the disabled certificate there is specific format it is better to follow that format about the ipd paper that is habit in the most of the nursing homes because 80% of the indian uh, healthcare is given by the nursing homes the daily report of this uh, daily notes of the surgeon as well as the visiting doctors with proper chronological sequence you have to see that you are uh, using the proper days and follow one after another 
you have to have a daily or complete all orders nothing like ct all all documents like surgical notes and access record as just a doctor has told that should be written properly in details and in icu make sure your doc you document the patient's deterioration and the likelihood of the patient death that has to be informed if you are if you are doing a good treatment to the patient and patient dies and if that is not mentioned there then you are liable for uh, negligence how about the consent which is huge topic half an hour talk itself on the consent and unfortunately the most neglected document is which in the peripheral part of india and judges are giving now lot of importance to this consent take patient signature also compulsory only if the patient is unconscious or raised and very years old you can uh, uh, you then no need but for every patient is better to have write in detail about the diagnosis and what procedure you are going to do in the consent mention other alternatives which are possible operative non operative mention if additional surgery is required you know there is a possibility of bone grafting you have to mention that then possibility of the change of the plan on operation table also has to mention before surgery right from the close reduction to the open reduction from arthroscopy to the open surgery it has to mention beforehand then mention all possible complications and treatment required for them and in case of serious adverse react uh, behind especially for nursing homes you have to mention that patient may be shifted to the higher institution where the further management will be required and when you are shifting the patient please uh, mention uh, 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 keep in mind that it is your responsibility to uh, take the patient to the uh, major uh, centers and you have to have preferably cardiac ambulance or company the doctor it is your responsibility till the patient goes to the better center then another part is possible of the death during anesthesia before surgery during surgery and even in the post op period has to be mentioned in every consent case reported of death in tonsillectomy because it has happened that there are cases which are reported in the tonsillectomy also and the close reduction of the elbow even hardly 28 old male patient the patient has has died so mention everything about it and the most of the best managed cases in medically have been lost just because of the lacuny in the consent now about discharge card hospitals are not paying much attention especially senior doctors and the institutions they leave it to the juniors to fill up the discharge card my suggestion to all the doctors is that you spend little bit more time be more alert when you are giving discharge card to the patient because act of the omission not writing something is also taken as a negligence now what maintenance of the record there are no different guidelines in india the hospital follow their own pattern retaining the records for a varied period of time it is advisable to maintain records for 2 years in the opd and 3 years in the inpatient or the surgical cases but in case of consumer forum judge allows for condoning the delay in appropriate cases that means the records may be needed even after 3 years if the patient goes to consumer court and especially in pediatric cases a medical negligence can can be filed by a child up to age of the majority so if there is anything congenital deformity you get better mention the keep the record because child can sue you after when he becomes 18 years of age another part of the records that are subject of medico legal cases should be maintained until the final disposal of the case even though only a complaint or the notice is received it is better to keep rather it is it is said that the medical case record should be kept till you are alive now it is necessary that the government should frame guidelines for the duration for which medical records are preserved there are no government guidelines there are different guidelines for the by the association but not by the uh, central government because then the hospital will protect it from unnecessary litigation in the issues of the medical records now discussion with the patient never promise 100% result sab kuch theek ho jayega koi chinta mat karo never never give false hopes give confidence but don't give high expectation so far so good still anything can happen it should be the say especially for the risky patient in icu patient tell their patient that i will try my best i will try humanly best possible but there are limitations i cannot deliver you what you one cannot do so the final thing conclusion is you have to be winner in every situation keep cool head and sweet tongue be alert and have presence of mind don't try to prove your correctness especially for the quite uh, uh, you can say arrogant doctors have good insurance now anything any time anything can go wrong you have should have precise and complete documentation elaborate consent and good record keeping and lastly the convincing communication not only communication it has to be convincing communication thank you very much thank you dr kane i think that was very comprehensive um, i will now invite dr tatman wong and he is going to speak about accomplishing interdisciplinary teamwork in orthopedics uh, there is a question dr kane but we'll take it later Can you hear me? Yes. 
Yes. Okay. Thanks. Uh, thanks. Thanks, uh, Chairman. And this is my. This is the last topic. And uh, quite uh, easy. I think this is a daily routine. Is the uh, accomplishing interdisciplinary team in uh, orthopedics. I think uh, all of us has already is uh, involved a lot of uh, interdisciplinary team approach. So this is just the uh, definition. Okay. What is this uh, interdisciplinary team? So first, we I think all of you had heard about multidisciplinary team. This is how we define it. This is a kind of skill and uh, experience from different specialties, and uh, each specialties approach the difference at different consultation, and they just provide an individual uh, opinion. However, in interdisciplinary team, actually it integrate different specialty into one consultation. Uh, in inside, how to say within the conversation, you include the history taking, physical examination, diagnosis, and the management plan. Uh, last but not least, actually, this patient is involved in the management plan. And this now, this is another term is called a charge disappearing approach. This is uh, how to say actually, it's a less emphasis on the specific area or the discipline, but actually, it's may across different subspecialty they provide not only uh, their opinion but this is a kind of co collaborative uh, process so the advantage of uh, interdisciplinary print is uh, actually this is a patient center approach uh, because uh, as you know this is just a one consultation so it's quite uh, cost effective and because there are lots of uh, specialty involved, so there's maybe some innovation service may be developed. And most important things is uh, the uh, special the, the specialty or discipline uh, the the discipline uh, provide the almost the, the the similar conclusion. This achieve the same goal. So why we need a disciplinary approach in orthopedics? Because uh, for example, in the Asian population. Uh, we okay. We are facing large number of the patient with more complex uh, 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 situation. Most likely, it's like a fracture hips, geriatric fracture hips. They okay, they are old age. They have uh, multiple morbidities, maybe heart disease, lung disease, or even they have a poor ambulatory before. So we need the teams to facilitate. And also, we have we have a more increasing complexity of uh, skills and knowledge to provide the difficulty situation, for example, orthopedic tumors. And also, actually, this is an increasing specialization within our health profession. And that's why we need more specialty and resulting in no one, uh, uh, no one healthcare. And we need more professional that to meet all the companies of our patient. And this is in many countries, this uh, current emphasis is that uh, uh, we have a multi-professional teamwork and development of a shared learning as well. And this is most important, we provide continuity care to our patient. So how we make a good uh, interdisciplinary team or competency? Of course, we need a good leader and uh, they, it, he or she has a clear direction and clear vision of the team. And of course, it will listen to listen from listen opinion from the team members. And it will he or she will incorporate all the values that provide direction to uh, for the team's surface, as well as the it should be the value should be visible and portrayed and measurable. And demonstrate a good team culture as well. And they have a, they should have a trust with each other and have a similar value as well as a consensus. And of course, the leader or the team should ensure appropriate process and also the infrastructure are in place. And they should have uh, uphold the vision of service, for example, referral criteria, communication infrastructure. And they should provide a quality patient service. Of course, as uh, we mentioned already, with uh, well-documented outcomes, and of course, we need a feedback of whether our quality of care is good or not. And this is most important. We have a very good communication strategy and promote an intra-team uh, intra communication, collaborative decision-making, 
and effective team process. So as mentioned, we need to have a very good uh, uh, sufficient team staffing to integrate all the skills, competency, and personalities. And of course, in the team, we have to facilitate the recruitment of staff that they have a very good uh, communication as well as they demonstrate very good interdisciplinary competency. And of course, we have to promote the role independent or we empower uh, our team members. Okay, we have a trust with each other. And at the same time, we should have a kind of training, reward, uh, recognition. And of course, there's a, they have, they should know the opportunities for future career development. So this is kind of uh, example of an uh, interdisciplinary approach in health of repeated care. Uh, I would say is uh, mentioned geriatric hip, awful geriatrical management. This is a team approach to manage a geriatric hip fracture. We have uh, interdisciplinary care and we have a co-ownership and also we have a clinical pathway and for geriatric uh, co-management, we have uh, emergency physicians that the patient admitted and then we have an uh, orthopedic surgeon because most of the time patients have fractured hip. The first doctor they will see is the orthopedic surgeon. But of course, we need a geriatrician to optimize their health before surgery. And we need to have an uh, anesthetist, uh, nurses. Sometimes we may need a social workers. Not, uh, last but not least, we need a rehab team as well as some uh, physician assistant to help as well. So, for the management, because this is a kind of inter interdisciplinary approach, and lots of paper already suggest, okay, it can decrease the length of stays, reduce the complication rates, lower readmission rates. The patient will have a better restoration of quality of life. And uh, our last but not least is the cost reduction. So this is just our paper uh, in Hong Kong. Uh, this is kind of interdisciplinary approach. You can see the total cost, the uh, mortality, as well as the length of stays is decreased after we implement such approach to our patient suffering from geriatric hip fracture. So in conclusion, interdisciplinary approach in orthopedic management, especially geriatric hip fracture is quite important. And I would say the approach not only provide better care to our patient, but also reduce the cost. And in general, it reduce our, our financial burden in our society. So most important thing, this interdisciplinary approach is a patient self approach. So this is the end of my presentation and thank you for your kind attention. Thank you, Dr. Wong. That was very comprehensive, I think. Um, Dr. Sasinder is not going to summarize everything we discussed. And after that, there are two medical legal questions to Dr. Carney, which we will uh, briefly uh, talk about at the end of Sasinder's talk. Sasinder, please go ahead. Yeah. Thank you very much, everyone. I thank all the faculty and uh, viewers for joining us for this session on soft skills in orthopedics. We could at a lot of times be wanting for better exposure in certain areas of our practice in orthopedics that definitely includes soft skills. Dr. Alvaro made a wonderful presentation. He talked about the patient's perspective. The patient does not come to the orthopedician to know what the orthopedician knows. The patient wants to know what her or his problem is. So it is very important to address the patient's concern in his or her own perspective also. There are two things that have to be ticked in the checklist when the patient leaves the room after seeing the orthopedician. One is whether or not we really built a rapport with the patient and whether we educated the patient sufficiently. First, listening is very important. And as William Osler said, 
listen to your patient he is telling you the diagnosis listening can help you in the diagnosis per se and can also half treat the patient a happy patient is possibly not going to sue the other patient so a happy patient is a better option for the other patient than an unhappy patient that is going to sue later we had a discussion on building the orthopedic team when it comes to the working of a team there has to be a team leader and the leader should know how to direct not boss the team the leader should be able to collaborate with the team members and coordinate them to achieve the goal rather than order the team members he should know the skills and limitations so that he can redirect the activities or the uh, uh, requirements as per the goals that are to be achieved this also holds good for interdisciplinary work dr wong talked about the difference between interdisciplinary work and multidisciplinary work that is something that we need to know and it is also useful for the patient because uh a, a multidisciplinary an interdisciplinary approach can be very helpful for the patient and less expensive also however the team leader should be responsible for the team building and he should also know the members clearly and what their capacity is not the least patient documentation that ajay clearly explained the medical legal requirement of patient documentation but it is also the right of a doctor in order to make the patient outcomes better because uh, a good documentation will also help the subsequent treating physician or orthopedician to make the right choice for the patient it is very important to time out and sign out the patient and uh, we also went through certain uh, abbreviations which can help us to make sure we do not miss out on certain aspects of patient documentation to be precise to be short accuracy and completeness of documentation is very important and the team should have a standardized documentation practice so that this does not affect the efficacy of the team and with respect to dealing with medical legal issues it is always better to be safe than sorry most of the times if you are able to have a good communication with the patient it the medical legal issues go hand in hand with communication and a good communication can avoid half the medical legal issues that are possible and in addition you should also make sure the patient is well informed and that is recorded either written or audio visually the era is changing more and more towards better evidence not only in medicine but also in documentation so for high risk patient it is a possibility and sometimes a necessity to have audio visual recording of the consent of the patient before going ahead with the surgery it is also essential to adhere to the ethics and legal guidelines this is common whether or not the patient is from the north america or south america or from the asia certain guidelines or the principles or the guidelines are similar and it is always better to be safe than sorry so with this um, summary i would like to go back to the questions yeah. go ahead please uh, the two questions from the audience um one is Uh, is hand to Dr. Kadi. Is handwritten consent admissible in court? Well, handwritten consent by the patient. It should be written by the patient. The handwritten consent done by the uh, doctors. It may not be acceptable to them, but handwritten consent is always better than the blanket printed consent. Now these are the computer days in which if you are having the computer printed consent where the patient's name, the signatory's name is there already printed on the paper. then that will be taken as a consent but a blanket printed paper which is uh, given by certain associations 
and if you just fill in the blanks then that will not be accepted so handwritten consent is always better and preferable in the patient's handwriting but maybe in the language of the patient as well that, yeah of course of course in the, the patient can even your uh, computer consent also should be in the language the patient understands it in his own uh, language second question actually i don't understand what is exactly being asked but let me read it to you is it possible that hospitals cover its stuff legally in codes by authentication of lawyers for example not very clear can you other can anyone well, well i think uh, that maybe that the something wrong happens from the hospital staff say for example the nurse is giving injection intravenous instead of intramuscular like streptomycin and something goes wrong with the higher doses of the uh, certain uh, 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 drugs then you, you should have a hospital insurance there are two different insurances those who own the hospital i always say you should have a separate hospital insurance in which your all the staff is covered because uh, there you cannot defend these things uh, uh, it is there is something in india which is known as vicarious responsibility anything goes wrong with the patient even if in the absence of the doctor in the at the midnight the nurses or some whatever doing something wrong things uh, uh, without knowledge of the doctor still doctor is held responsible for that so apart from the doctor's indemnity it is better to the hospital indemnity also rather these days the hospital is penalized for almost 80% and doctor is penalized only for 20% so better to have a hospital insurance and in india you won't get every time highly qualified or the highly trained people so this is the one uh, safe uh, out, outlet you can uh, say that you should have a indemnity of the hospital also and that of a i'll say two to two and half times more than the what the doctor's indemnity is that yeah but do you think the names of the people who are treating them it's not possible to keep track of all the nurses treating and all the technicians and no no there is no need to you have to, uh, there is no need to put the uh, name of the uh, nurse or something but then it is proved that the nurse has given injection then something has gone wrong some, some this happens mostly for the uh, case like injection reactions abscesses or those kind of things where the hospital staff is held guilty otherwise when the operation something goes wrong the operation technique is only doctor who is there but uh, uh, certain things go can go wrong the image entities where suddenly stops working suddenly something uh, uh, the things like a fire or other things so there the doctor is held responsible for all such thing it has happened that even the uh resident doctor were arrested for the uh, fire in the icu they were arrested and she was there for almost 6 weeks so it is better to have this is a criminal legal criminal is something totally different but for financial things it is better to have insurance and one should understand that doctor is liable for everything happens in the region. that is actually very bad but i am telling you what is the scenario there that's why now the new nursing homes are not coming up that rapidly as they were coming around 10 years ago so sure. Okay, thank you. I think you have answered these questions quite comprehensively. So, before we finish, are there any questions from the faculty or anything else? Any questions? Okay, good. So, I think uh, this discussion was very good. I hope it will be useful to the worldwide audience. And uh, with this um, excellent presentation, all these ex- uh, presentations from the faculty. Uh, i think this was our second webinar from on behalf of the education committee we will have one more this year and uh, with this we complete this uh, webinar thank you very much for your participation the lectures and your help thank you very much thank and you. The, thank you thank you thank you thank you everybody thank you thanks bye bye bye